Hello everyone, we're back, another project, and uh, what we have on the bench today is actually one of my favorite, if not my favorite, low power receivers on that uh, that I've ever worked with. Um, it's a, the Realistic STA64, and the first time I saw one of these was in the late 70s. Uh, my neighbor across the street had an old console stereo and he wanted to use the speakers and the cabinets and everything in it but get you know update his stereo system you know get rid of the old <laughs> thing that was in there wore out so we went out to the local radio shack and I was pretty young at the time still living at home and you know we found this on sale it was on a closeout sale because it was last year's model and you know not knowing much else we listened to it it sounded really really good so he purchased it and we brought it to his house and I set it all up and I updated the speakers bought some new drivers and some new tweeters and so forth and put a made a little crossover um, out of <laughs> pinball machine solenoid coils that you know that I used to make uh, speaker crossovers with you know you, you used what you had at the time and when I first turned this thing on, I could not believe what a little 16 watt per channel receiver could do. First of all, the aluminum, the, you know, the, the presentation of it, it's a very nice looking little receiver. And, but for, for what it is, the sound is incredible. Now, I don't know that I would call this audiophile. Um, because it has a really warm sound. Of course, when you hear people say warm sound and things like that, you know, it kind of may color the sound a little bit. Um, but it does it in such a way that, to my ears, that I really love the sound of this amp. It has a personality of its own. Um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of other receiver gear out there that does not color the sound, is more accurate than this will be. But it just is easy on the ears. Uh, it is has really good volume for being a 16 watt receiver, and the bass response on this thing is second to none. It is phenomenal. Even on a large set of speakers, this receiver can drive those large speakers. The design inside, you know, how the circuitry is designed, is pretty smart. It's kind of intuitive and it has a few things in it that makes it a little bit uh, different than your other receivers out there. Uh, the main thing um, is this Quattrovox and if you try to look that up, okay, the Quattrovox, you try to look that up online and you're not going to find a lot of information about it. Um, but really all it is is it's a switch this is a big uh, ganged deck switch you know wafer switch and by when you turn this in it if you have four speakers connected to it uh, I think it wires them out of phase or something like that a little it does something to give it a, a simulated quadraphonic sound, like a, a wide stereo sound. It's kind of a poor man's quadraphonic, I guess you want to say. Uh, it's a gimmick. It's not. There's nothing special, and I don't see in the schematic any special circuitry other than something it does to the wiring or something uh, when you switch the quadravox in. So we'll look at that a little bit when we look at the schematics. Now, I purchased this for myself when I saw it for a good price online and uh, for the reasons that I just discussed. But also, you know, just look, I mean, it's got a real, real wood cabinet, you know. And this is a, you know, walnut veneered finish that's very dried out and faded right now. But we're going to clean this up and it's going to look really nice. Um, these were beautiful receivers when they were brand new. Um, the tuner is really good in them. Uh, it's phase lock loop multiplex. We'll get a little bit into that. Uh, nothing fancy about it. Once again, it's, it's built to a cost a little bit. But this receiver sold for $239 or um, $240. Bucks. 
uh, when it was new. So that was a lot of money for a 16 watt receiver. But you got, you know, it's got weighted tuning on it. Um, all the basic features you would want to see on a basic receiver. You know, bass treble balance, all the, you know, loudness switch, tape monitor, phono input, auxiliary input, nice aluminum knobs. Uh, when you look at the knobs, they have plastic inserts on the inside, but the outside of the knobs um, are actual little tiny, thin, very thin pieces of aluminum. They'll clean up and polish up really well. Now, this receiver was described as no power not working on power up. So I'm not even going to turn this on until I take it apart and look at some things. Um, these were notorious. They had the, those Japanese electrolytic capacitors that were very prone to shorting and failing and leaking. So my suspicion is that may have happened and it may have blown a fuse or it may have may have even damaged things. I don't know. But uh, I'm going to pull this out of the cabinet, bring it, you know, bring it up on a dim bulb very carefully, and see where we're at. But I can guarantee you, I, not even without a question, full recap. It needs all new capacitors. They failed in this. Uh, you're just playing playing roulette with this thing if you try to uh, run it without recapping it. So that'll be the first thing that gets done. And then we'll see if we can do a few things to it to make it even a little better. Um, but wow, this is a this is a really nice receiver. I enjoy it. And when this one's done, it's probably going to take the place of my uh, my little digital receiver that I use up in my room at night to listen to the ball games and things like that. Uh, with a set of home built speakers that I have, I think it'll go really well with that. So if that sounds interesting to you. Um, stay tuned and we'll go through this one and do the routine. I have the receiver out of the case now and uh, besides being kind of dusty and dirty I've right off the bat noticed a few problems that this thing has. Uh, problem number one as I suspected you can see right here this capacitor is pretty badly uh, corroded. It looks like it leaked. If you look down on this end you can see that this capacitor looks like this one here has really leaked badly. So we're getting a lot of problems on the power supply board. So this power supply board is going to have to be completely rebuilt. And hopefully the you know I haven't looked underneath yet, but hopefully none of the tracks have been damaged to the point that you know I'm going to have to do any big major repairs on them. So if we move over to the amplifier section, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> uh, if I zoom in down here, I think you can see one of the current limiting resistors has toasted and usually that indicates that one of your output transistors has shorted. Um, looking at the fuses, strangely enough, uh, the fuses do not look as if they've blown. I mean, they look uh, pretty... they're intact. I mean, I'll measure them to make sure, but I can see the filament going all the way across on both of them. That's not uncommon on these smaller built to a cost amplifiers. The fuses sometimes will just go through the speaker terminals themselves at the output, but they are there is no fusing between your power supply and your you know your amplifier section, you know, and the rest of the receiver. So if something fails, you know, there is one fuse in line. If you have a major short, it'll take that fuse out and as you can see Here's the fuse cap. Here's the fuse. It has failed pretty bad. It's blown and you can see the little spot where it blew. So we know we have a dead short in here. So there's really no no reason to even try to power this thing up at this, at this point in time. Uh, we're going to have to find all the blown components and do some short testing. 
Um, I see another capacitor over here that's leaked in what looks to be the preamp section. You can see there. And uh, let me put this into manual focus mode. And then we can maybe get this thing to focus a little better for you. And that's all you get on that one. So um, you can see, not very good. We have a lot of leakage down here. Uh, so, like I said, when all the capacitors start to kind of do their thing like that, the best thing to do before you even start powering one of these up is recap the whole thing. I mean, if it's good enough that you could just barely do a power through a you know dim bulb tester and you can test it, uh, you're always better off doing it that way. But when things are this far gone, you really want to go through it and rebuild things first and kind of take your time and test it. So that's what we're going to do. And uh, once we get the thing recapped and clean up things in here, we'll do our first initial power up. I know that we're probably going to have to replace some transistors, which is a shame because these transistors were specifically designed in the 1970s for uh, low power up to 22 watts per channel receivers and they're specifically built for audio and that's one of the reasons this amp sounded so incredible is that the, the silicon they used in these the, the transistors were a very good quality for the day they were made by Sanyo and they really had good sound now you know I'll, I'll have to replace them with modern replacements which will perform the same you know I think will be okay but for the day these things really sounded nice so that's where we're at and that's where we're going the power supply is all done now and as you can see I got the board really cleaned off all new capacitors new uh, diodes I just went ahead and replaced the rectifiers they were getting that black dirty crusty stuff on them and I, I don't like that uh, I replaced this transistor this SCR I have a hundred volt version but this is a 200 volt and uh, so I'm, I'm probably not the hundred one would probably work but uh, I may leave this but it's really badly corroded on the leads and to the point where if I bend it it'll probably break the leads off and usually what happens is that tarnish actually creeps up inside the case gets onto the silicon and trashes the device so it may not work or it may work after a while who knows everything else is pretty good now uh, you know this thing has what I would call capacitor blight which is when you have chronic every capacitor just fails this one is really swelled up really bad this one is a little bit swollen this one is swollen and puffing and leaking this one right here Let's see which one it was. This one. This one is swollen down here. Uh, you know, so they're all just, they're, they're bad. They need replaced. Um, looking, I just did a little spot check. I just set my meter on ohms only and went into here. I just wanted to, you know, being that this resistor here is toasted, uh, I checked these. And sure enough, I have a collector to emitter dead short um, <clears throat> on this transistor. The other three seem to be okay, but usually when one of them gets stressed out, uh, you know, you don't know what the other one's going to do. Um, so these are going to need replaced. I have some really good modern replacements for these um, that are 65 watt transistors. These are 22, 25 watt transistors. So uh, you know same characteristics other than more power handling. Uh, anytime you lose something like this, like an output transistor, you want to go back and check all your drivers and preamps. Uh, a lot of times you end up finding that there are problems with them. They either leak uh, or short. A lot of times 
you know, one of them will actually go leaky and it'll throw the bias way off on the output transistor and that's what causes the outputs to burn up. The outputs actually are pretty well protected. They have thermal protection through this thermistor. They have current limiting resistors on them. So really, if you don't mess the bias up on them, uh, they will tend to work for a really long time uh, and, and be reliable. Uh, again, the transistor or the capacitors I've taken out so far, about half of them have been bad. So again, this re this receiver has capacitor blight. So again, I'm just going to replace everything. It's not expensive. These components are all things I have in stock. I haven't even had to order anything. Um, the other thing that goes bad sometimes, I'll try to keep this clip short, but. Uh, the other thing that goes bad sometimes, just want to give you a note here, is there's two Zener diodes, a 13 volt and a 20 volt, 4 volt. The 13 volt in a lot of these little receivers like this will go bad. So I shotgunned it and I replaced the half an or half watt one with a nice one watt one. So that's where we're at. Uh, got a lot of rebuilding to do on here, and then I'll be back. All right, I'm back and. Um, it's been a few days, been kind of working in between other projects and other things. And uh, apologize for the uh, fan, the blower running in the background, but it's 88 degrees out and pretty hot today. So the air conditioning's running, so uh, kind of bear with me on that. So, so far here we are. We got the uh, inside of the receiver and the outside of the receiver cleaned up a little bit and we replaced all of the capacitors as you can see we went with good high quality ones um, this transistor right here was dead shorted and this resistor here was cooked so I went ahead and replaced the uh, current limiting resistors and put a new set of MJE3055 transistors which is uh, a 90 watt uh, replacement transistor so it's really good they'll never wear out a couple little things before we continue here you might be interested in I don't know I'll go over with you if you take a look at the schematic that we have here you'll notice that uh, similar to the quasi complementary amplifier that we built from the little kit the little inexpensive kit focused. You can see where this is actually using two NPN transistors on the output. Uh, unlike a lot of these amps that have an NPN and a PNP with the differential voltage, this one is using kind of an older style circuit using the two NPNs. Uh, now that's kind of a little where the similarities start to taper off. As you can see, these are not direct Darlington connected, uh, you know, the drivers to the outputs. If you notice, we have resistors and, you know, coupling resistors and so forth. Uh, this is still a direct coupled amplifier. But as you can see, a lot of the rest of the circuit is similar to the quasi complementary amplifier that we built. Uh, one of the, one modification that I like is we of course have the dual diode pack and these are they call these varistors they're really they're diodes and they're designed to put the the necessary voltage differential between the two stages you know the uh, you know the, the two phases and one interesting thing they did here was they put the third diode in here to raise the voltage up to the proper amount and then they put a shunt resistor that's actually a variable it's a pot and that's how you adjust the voltage across this diode to set up the bias. And what they have you do is they just have you measure across one of these current limiting resistors and set it for a specific, uh, you know, a specific voltage. And basically what they're looking for is an idle current of about 20 milliamps, okay? And that's not super important on these smaller receivers. You get it close and it will work. Um, I actually did not have any 0.5 ohm resistors. I only had some 0.22s. 
So the voltage that they're telling us in the procedure to set this to is going to be different because the voltage drop is going to be different because the resistance is different. But I was still able to get this adjusted and it works perfectly. The amp sounds fantastic. I did a uh, power test and it's by all intents and purposes um, across almost the whole spectrum. It's almost 22 watts. It's a solid 21 watts clean power and uh, only till you get down around the 20 to 30 hertz range does the distortion start coming in at 21 watts and if I back the power down to about 19 the the distortion drops off very low so this amp is very flat response and it has that beautiful warm sound that I was talking about uh, really crisp highs so amplifier wise I'm very happy now when it comes to the receiver uh, the amp does have some or the receiver does have some issues and uh, what I found is it seems to be rather sensitive but it's not very selective and I think and what I mean by that is when I turn the, the tuning knob uh, what's happening is I'm taking up a very wide portion of the dial picking up the same station okay and this is with just hooking up my outside antenna to it um, and it kind of doesn't lock you don't get like a lock onto the station very well so my guess right now is that we're going to have something wrong in the I, in it with an IF section uh, either it's out of alignment it also could be one of these uh, crystal filters is uh, not working properly is failing we saw on the one pioneer receiver that I did we it had a bad filter and it caused the receiver to be deaf uh, this one's just kind of lost its uh, selectivity it does have fairly good sensitivity so I think the front end of the receiver is pretty good we're just going to need to deal with the IF and the filters so that's what we're going to do now we're going to try to connect up some test equipment and do a few ch tests Stereo does work on this, so I don't think we're going to have to mess around with the multiplex at all. Uh, I think basically it's going to be all about trimming up the IF section and maybe replacing, you know, a filter or something, you know, something that's kind of not to bring that selectivity up where it needs to be. So uh, let's get some test equipment hooked up and kind of look through the, the directions on this and we'll go from there. Okay, let's hold up production here for a minute. What you are looking at is the edge of where the tuning dial, you can see here where's the tuning cord, goes on to the side of the tuning capacitor. This shaft was actually pulling out and this screw right here, this tiny little tightening screw right here you can see and then another one on the other side right over here were both literally falling out loose so this whole thing was wobbling around to make matters worse um, the shaft was actually pulling out away from here and decoupling and what it ended up being was there is a little dado notch on the shaft way right in here and there was supposed to be a little e-clip holding that on and that e-clip was missing it was altogether gone luckily I had some spares here I don't know if you could see them and uh, I just took an extra little e-clip and uh, popped it onto the shaft here which was not very easy and now everything's tracking perfectly and I think that's what was happening to my sensitivity is that as I was moving the tuning knob this whole thing was moving around so that must have been an issue that uh, was with the radio you know when I got it um, they probably thought the tuner was bad as I did too and that's all it was so I put a little e-clip in there and tightened those two screws and now everything's good and I think it's gonna track good now so there you go Well, I'll tell you, it's pretty amazing what uh, tightening up that tuner uh, capacitor can do because now that that's all 
tightened up. Everything just totally fell into place. The alignment is pretty much dead on. I, I touched a couple of the IF trimmers and found that they right where they were is where they needed to be. Um, I'm, you know, stereo separation is great. Multiplex, the pilot detection, everything is great. So I'm really not going to play with you know the alignment of the tuner whatsoever. Uh, the only thing I did find was on the AM, uh, the little adjustment in the end of the antenna, which is back here. There's a slug down in there that you can tune the antenna to, you know, to make it a little more matched to the tuner. That that slug needed a little bit of adjustment, but other than that, everything was really spot on. So there isn't much to do here left except. I'm down to one final little problem that we have to try to figure out what it is. And I think I know what it is, but we're going to have to troubleshoot it and figure it out. Um, first, I'd like to introduce you to a new addition to the bench. And this, as you can see, is a pretty, pretty low-end oscilloscope. Um, it's made by a company called Atten. Atten really never manufactured oscilloscopes. Uh, they really uh, they make power supplies and some soldering equipment and things like that. For a short while they released this one which is actually the same as the Siglent, I think it's called the SD, uh, this is the ADS1102 and I think Siglent has one called a SDS1102. It's the identical scope and actually the firmware I have running on this, which is the latest out there, is actually Siglent's uh, firmware. It works perfectly on this. Uh, there was a bug with these, with the trigger. Uh, we use these out in the field to uh, to capture uh, waveforms, uh, you know, of X-ray generators to be able to observe the exposure. Uh, usually, an X-ray machine puts out a very short pulse. Uh, of radiation obviously you know less less than a you know it's just in the milliseconds so we use digital storage oscilloscopes to capture those waveforms when we're calibrating or testing the machines and this one had trigger issues and it's it's old and you know it was purchased for you know for one of our you know a little bit lower end starting position type scopes and uh, so we upgraded our employee to a, a better scope and this one ended up getting retired, so it's perfect for looking at my load for my audio bench. So, you know, if you want to look across the 8 ohm load, that this is permanently connected for audio analyzing now. I like it because it has the built-in measurements, so we can measure the actual RMS of the of the signal directly. And uh, I was doing my power test, which I think we discussed this earlier in the video, which is we're getting somewhere in the line of 21 watts pretty clean power per channel uh, but what I did notice is there is an imbalance of the two channels when you put an equal signal on each channel I'm getting an unequal signal out so the first thing I noticed up here so let's zoom in on scope number one uh, this is the actual speaker terminal output and I have 300 millivolts RMS feeding into the auxiliary input uh, terminals of the receiver and I have the balance set at center and I have the bass and treble controls at, set, at flat um, loudness contour is out and if I adjust this and start to go up on my volume uh, you can see that they're just this one is just touching the two lines there you can see but as you can see this one is actually overhanging it slightly now you know yeah can you hear that difference probably not um, but as you adjust the different tone controls and things uh, you can see it will affect the two channels sometimes differently so I think we still have a little bit of cleaning in the controls to do uh, now scope number two just to make sure that I'm not crazy here let me move this uh, waveform down a little bit um, you can see 
This is a representation of the signal going into the power amplifier board. And when I adjust it so that it's just kissing the lines, okay, you can see, I mean, I'm not, can't be totally exact, but you can see that once again, channel one has a little bit more output than channel two. If we really align, you can see we don't have an exact match. So the good news is the power amplifier is perfect. It's working. And what it's doing is almost exactly a 10 to 1 amplification. So if I put one volt in, I should get about 10 volts out to the speaker terminals to an 8 ohm load. That's pretty much the way this one is working right now, anyways, from what I'm seeing. But, again, these should be more equal. And let me just rotate the balance knob just a little bit. And as you can see, if I move the balance knob and balance these up, okay, so pretty close to there. You can see I have those balanced. The output here also balances up pretty good. Okay, uh, you can see this one's overhanging the top, this overhanging the bottom. It's just where I have the markers positioned. But anyways, the power amplifier is good. It seems to be coming from the preamp. And if I take you off of the camera stand here for a second, and we look at right here, you can see... I don't know if you can... It's a little... You can see where I'm at. So we're way off on our uh, on our balance control. So what I need to do is uh, I'm going to take this apart. Whenever you see a problem like that, um, the way to handle it is you want to first of all do some static tests um, without you know without the receiver being powered up. And the way to do that is you want to just go ahead and disconnect your amp, flip it over, and you want to take your meter and set it on ohms and just statically measure the DC resistance of the two potentiometers, you know, for the right and left side for volume and so forth to see if you actually have a problem in the actual resistive values of the pots. I can't tell you how many times I've taken apart a uh, you know, a receiver and measured the resistance of the two elements of, of a stereo potentiometer and found that one of them has a different resistance value than the other. They're not very well matched. That's the difference between when you get a low-cost carbon potentiometer and you go with a high-end, you know, either a wire wound or better yet, even a uh, step attenuator, which is really kind of a, just a, a bunch of little switches that switch in uh, very high precision resistors. Now those step, those step potentiometers or step attenuators as we call them, those ones give you very matched resistance the whole way across the board for your right and left channels. Okay, where was I? Phone rang and you know how it goes. 20 minutes later, uh, you're back to where you were. But anyways, we're going to take this apart. We're going to check the two, uh, check all of the potentiometers to make sure that there's no mechanical, I'll call that a mechanical problem really, you know, the the wipers of the pot and the, you know, and the resistance of the carbon and so forth. Anything, make sure it's not something goofy like that. I highly doubt that there's a problem uh, in, the, in the preamp board, you know, with capacitors or with resistors or with a, a semiconductor. Um, I think it's more than likely going to be a pot. So, because uh, everything's working perfectly and it sounds wonderful, uh, the sound is very clear, everything's good. So, we're going to do that and then uh, I'll let you know what I find out. I'm going to get the cabinet all cleaned up and put together and I'll give you one last final look on it and we'll go from there. Well, what do you know? That was an easier fix than I thought. All it was was the balance control just needed cleaned. I mean, it just still had a little bit of dirt in it. Um, needed another coating of deoxit and needed worked a little bit more. And we have a perfect balance now. 
So I'm going to call this one finished and I'm going to get the cabinet all cleaned up and uh, put it together and I think we've got another one here ready to go. And here it is, the almost finished product. The only thing left to do is put the dial lights in. I have some interesting new dial LED replacement lights. They're supposed to be drop-in replacements that plug into these uh, funny little wedge sockets. You know, you can see these just kind of sit in there. Let me see if I can get one out. There you go, you can see the socket and you can see the the bulb and uh, they're very inexpensive and they look like they'll disperse the light better than most of the LED replacements I've seen out there so we'll check and see how they work out and uh, when they come in but uh, here's the finished receiver it turned out really really good I'm happy with it and this one's actually probably going to be the one that goes up into my uh, into our bedroom with uh, my homemade speakers Maybe I'll take a shot of that when I get it set up. Um, I like to listen to the ball games at night sometimes and listen to some music when I'm getting ready in the morning or whatever. But you know, I have a little another little uh, STA 111 receiver up there right now. But I really like this one. I really like the sound of these and how they perform. So I think I'm going to put this one up there now. But uh, I'll give you a little quick just on the. Uh, Minimus 7 speakers, I'll give you an idea. More of the fun uh, music library from, e from uh, YouTube. Just keeping everything at flat settings. you liked it. Uh, this wasn't really as exciting of a video as some of the other restor restorations I did. I uh, just needed a transistor, a recap job, and uh, tighten up the tuning assembly there, the tuning gang. And uh, really this thing was off to the races. So hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you did, give me a thumbs up. That always helps out the site a little bit. And um, I got some other things coming in here to come on the bench, so it won't be long. I'll be putting out a few more videos depending on the work schedule and everything. That kind of dictates things. But, uh, yeah, everybody have a wonderful day, and uh, catch you on the next video.